Okay, are we on? All right. Okay, guys, uh, the very first session for 2014 Roundup. I'm excited to, to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Harry Flanagan. I work for Pure Desire Ministries International. I've been with uh, this ministry since it was formed in uh, 1993, and uh, uh, it's a I have a lot of passion, but I'm really especially excited about um, this session and the next session, which is for pastors, because I think that we've created a culture in the American church, cross denominational lines, that almost makes it impossible to biblically be sound as a pastor, because we've created an environment where, where for many pastors, it's not safe for them to be honest and open. It's not safe for them to be authentic. And, and so I think it's, it's a difficult job. And if you are called to be a pastor and you're here, I'm, I, I, I want you to know that, that every day we pray for you because we know what a difficult job you have. Because I believe that if the church doesn't get their act together, in, in the area of dealing with, with addictions, there's, it's going to be impossible for the church to, uh, to go through revival. We, we were recently, and the statistics are going to show up on the screen here in a little bit, but we were asked by Saddleback Church in, uh, down in Southern California to do a survey for their pastoral website. And this pastoral website is a website just for uh, uh, preaching tools and, and ideas for ministry, and people from all over the world go to that website to fill it out. And we had, uh, I believe that the results were 55% of the men who went to that website acknowledged in, in an anonymous survey they were struggling with, with sexual addiction issues. And 25% of the, 24% of the women acknowledge that same battle going on in their lives. This is, this, is a, this is a huge issue for us. And if the church, if the church doesn't deal with this issue, it, it's going to be horrific. So um, I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm passionate about getting the word of God out. However, I think when we're talking to the unchurched, uh, uh, we have to use language they understand. So today I'm going to be talking about some, uh, some true biblical concepts, but you will notice in my language that I'm going to use language that is, I'm hoping, fresh for them, and maybe fresh for you. For example, um, when I'm talking about sin, I'm going to tell people my definition of sin is that I have a legitimate need that I seek to meet in an illegitimate manner. I have a real need, but how I meet that need is unhealthy and it's, and it's wrong, so it's illegitimate. And, and, and that's a language that people who have not had the opportunity to be exposed to the word of God can respond to. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, so, uh, so as we go through this, uh, um, uh, this, this is a, a composite of a series that I do that it consists of 16 hours of seminar work uh, dealing with shame and shame resiliency all tied for me to the whole issue of sexual addiction because if we don't deal with shame, uh, the, the whole issue goes away. So... Uh, how many of you have figured out what the forbidden fruit is in, in Genesis 3 where uh, Adam and Eve ate that forbidden fruit? I am convinced it's not a golden delicious apple from the state of Washington. That's not what it is. I'm, in fact, I'm convinced that it was a kiwi. So until someone can prove me wrong, I'm going to call the forbidden fruit the kiwi. So, 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 uh, 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 Guys, in our, in our lives, we find ourselves in difficult situations. And in those difficult situations, we have to respond 
We have to respond to situations that feel out of our control. How many of you have ever felt judged and condemned? Yeah, okay. And, and when we feel judged and condemned, it, 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 it's huge for us because l- let, me, let me ask, what's the difference between guilt and shame? Okay, well, actually, you use a lot of theological terms, but, 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 but yes. How about um, guilt is more a legal definition of um, wrongdoing that has a payment, or shame is our internal reaction to what uh, we've done? You guys are all doing great, yes. We always quoted my group at church. Guilt makes you want to fix it. Shame makes you want to hide. Okay, I like that. I like that. So my definition, and it's only mine, is this. Guilt is about behaviors. You did something you shouldn't have done, or you did something that uh, you didn't do something you should have done. Does that make sense? So guilt is about behaviors. Shame is about you. Shame, shame, is, shame is about, well, in, in, in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve ate the kiwi and God showed up in the cool of the evening, what was Adam and Eve's first response to God showing up? Hiding, hiding, hiding fear. The, and, and, and literally out of Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 7, the answer is Adam in his conversations with God said, I was afraid. The word in the original language means the fear of exposure, which by the way is almost exactly the clinical definition of shame. The clinical, the clinical definition of shame is to be exposed and feel diminished by that exposure. So your definition is, was really good, I like it. So, so Shame causes us to hide. You know, when I was first dealing with this 20 years ago, I was reading that, and I was shocked because I always thought their first response was to hide. I thought that. I was just uh, recently speaking to a church of 4,000 back in upstate New York, and, and they just, they, they act like they were trained because in unison they said they hid. They did, and, and everybody says that but Adam himself. Adam says, I was afraid. So undealt with sin leads to shame. That shame leads to secrecy because they did hide. And secrecy always leads to separation. And so when we're dealing with something as shameful as sexual addiction, when we have values over here and we're living a lifestyle where we have hidden shame, and this is especially true for pastors, what kind of expectation do pastors have? <coughs> Excuse me, do pastors have in the church? They've got, they, you know, they're supposed to have their act together, which, by the way, is not a biblical concept. You know, the Bible says that we are going to be changed from glory to glory into their image. Who's the, who is the person you met? who just need a little bit of fine tuning to be measured up to, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, to be measured up to the, to the full stature and measure of Jesus. I don't know that person. I don't know of any person in history who measures up to Jesus. So we're all still in the process of going through dramatic transformation. But the problem is that the journey of transformation that people need to walk with Christ is a walk of vulnerability. And when you think of church, is, in your church, is it safe for you to have a problem in the present tense? Is it okay to do this? And one of the tests that you will find out is 
when you hear stories from the pulpit, not just from the senior pastor, but from the pulpit, do the stories tend to be old stories? It happened years ago, and they're not talking about the battles, the struggles that they're in today. I, I was working with a denomination, and in their Bible college, they said people in the pastorate are required to confess up and preach down, and that creates a good old boys club. And they actually called Pure Desire because they started having pastors fall right and left to sexual sin because they were creating, uh, uh, they were justifying a secret life. I've had other denominations actually, and non-denominational churches communicate that it's not okay for a pastor to bleed on his flock. And you know, I can't find that in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the verse I come to, it says in, 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 in Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 5, Paul waxes eloquent and he says, uh, we are members one of another. And I said, Paul, Paul, that sounds absolutely great, but what the heck does it mean? And then I, uh, one day I was reading further in, in Romans 12 and I hit verse 15 and I realized here's the definition. When one of us weeps, we all weep. When one of us, re when one of us rejoices, we all celebrate. The question is, how do I know to weep with you? How do I know to celebrate with you? I can't do that if you're not willing to tell your story. If you're not willing to be honest in the present tense. And that's, you know, this is a, the greatest battle. You're, if, you're not a, if you're not a pastor, pray for your pastor because this is one of the greatest bat battles your pastor faces because in some church cultures, in most church cultures in the United States, it's not okay to not be okay. So that actually pushes pastors into secret lives. And, and when they have a secret life, they're, they're in a situation where they think their job as a pastor is to act like they basically have their life together. And when they talk about what's not working right, when they talk about what's not working, it tends to be small things, not the real issues they struggle with in their lives. Now, there are exceptions to the rule, but they're very rare. Because if we don't change this church culture, if we don't actually all in the body of Christ go through a process of tr the transformation that Christ has for us, because when Christ walked the earth, he challenged the people around him. He, and he had the same expectation for those 12 crazy guys who, 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 who turned upside down the entire Roman culture. It takes courage to do this. Uh, and that's why I have a quote here from uh, my buddy, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, do, you know, do you know that he, for his, his, his run up San Juan Hill on his horse, he and five or six other men did this? He won the Congressional Medal of Honor for doing this. What's interesting is, do you know when he actually received the Congressional Medal of Honor? 2001, it was recommended clear back in the late 1800s when he was still in the military and, and it was never followed through with. And so he became president of our country, uh, not once but twice. He had the courage to actually change parties and go and become elected president for a second party when he ran. So he's a pretty amazing fellow. Uh, if you could hit this slide, thank you. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and, that, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly. I love that quote. 
Matter of fact, I get teary-eyed. I'm teary-eyed right now. I've been living with this thing for months now, and I am so caught up in, in this. It is such a powerful quote, but I ask you, where's your arena? Where is the place that you struggle the most in your life? Is it in your marriage? Is it the fact that there is in one shape or form a secret life where you either have behaviors that no one knows about or is there a place where you have a thought life that no one knows about? You know, the, 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 Bible, the, the section of the Bible that maybe scares me the worst is Matthew 23 where Jesus seven times uses the word hypocrites. And if you look at that word in the original language, if you take a strong, strong says it means the word actor. And it doesn't do the word justice. The word actually means an actor who wears a mask. So how many of you have ever had a day when you showed up at church and the truth is you really didn't want to be there? When I go, when I, when I go to conferences and speak strictly to pastors and they're away from their flock, and I ask that question, both hands go up. You know, they, 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 they both go up. And, and, and so when you show up there and you pull into the parking lot and you get out of the car and you close the door, what immediately comes on your face? The smile. And if someone says, hey, how are you? And your answer is? Great. Now, truth is, some of those people are just acknowledging, oh, rats, the pastor just you know, parked right next to me. They're just acknowledging you're there. When you meet someone in the hallway, they say, hey, hi. And they're really just saying, I know you're there. But some of them are people who really care about you, and they say, how are you? And when you say fine and you're not, this is, this is horrendous. Because in that moment, you're denying the church of Jesus Christ to be the church of Jesus Christ to you. You know, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, people said to him, Lord, we, we, did this, we, we testified in your name. We, we cast out demons in your name. We healed the sick in your name. And he said, go away from me because I don't know you. Because sometimes the mask becomes kind of permanently in place. See, we don't, we're not called biblically to act as if we have our act together to our church or to our families. We're called to be authentic with them. And when you have a battle, when you have a struggle, your role in this battle or struggle, your role is to show, say, would you admit with me that every one of us in this room will at some, will at some time in our life do a face plant? And how many of you believe that your family members are going to have a face plant also? We live in a fallen world, it happens. But here's the thing, if you don't admit your face plant and start dealing with it, they, you, the, those whom you love don't have a role model for how to walk out of their face plant, their failures. So it takes courage to admit you failed. It takes courage to admit you made a poor choice. It takes courage to acknowledge the consequences of what you've done. But you're also now equipping your, the people who you love and care for for what, for what they can do when their time comes and they fail. Now, probably fail in a different area than you, but they will fail. They will struggle with life. They're going to experience trauma and they're going to experience pain. But when they have you showing them. So on the next slide, it will automatically go to them if you just hit enter on that, okay? So, uh, so in the, uh, living in the area of pastoral ministry, because I was told that mostly there would be pastors here, but this is actually applies to everybody. When we do this, 
This, this is a practical definition of three steps of faith. You want to live a faith walk out, here are three things you have to do. First of all, in the arena, the place that you battle, you actually have to show up. You actually have to be in that uncomfortable place. How many of you love to avoid confrontation? Yeah, we don't like confrontation, and, and sometimes we find good reasons to justify why we don't need to talk to that person for a while. We tr you know, it becomes low on our, our priority list because we want to avoid the confrontation. But we have to show up in that area. This is, this is, wherever it is you show up and it's uncomfortable for you to be there, you are in the arena. But listen, for you to be in the arena, you have to be seen. And that means you have to take off the mask. You can't have masks. You have to be who you really are. So does anybody here remember an old, old, old Western? And it's sad for me to say that because I used to think of it as a new Western. But uh, uh, it, is, it is my favorite Christian movie, not because of the acting and certainly not because of the theme of the movie. Uh, but uh, in churches, I ask them this question. When I finally come up with a name, there's sometimes somebody will whistle the theme to the song. The, the movie that, I, that, that so inspires me by its title and that only is The Good, The Bad, and The, the Ugly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. So, so I think outside of the Bible, that is the best definition of humanity, that we all are good, bad, and ugly. We're good because we were created in God's image, right? We're bad. Every one of us have been tainted by sin. And even after we came to know and follow Christ, every one of us in this building has at one time or another made a really ugly decision. We all are good. By the way, for those of you who are pastors, that preaches. It really does, it's really good. So we are the good, bad, and ugly. But when to be seen means we need to be authentic. We need to be real. Because if we don't, if we don't, we put on the mask of the hypocrite and we moved into the stands in the arena instead of being in the arena. When you wear a mask, who is rewarded when you do well? It's going to be the mask. Because you have the card, the, 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 the hidden card that you can pull out. It says if people really know who I am, if they really knew what I've been thinking, if they really knew what I've done, they wouldn't be saying those things to me. So all the praise goes to the mask. In, in Romans chapter five, uh, chapter 5, verse 8, Jesus said, you know, I loved you when you were still sinners. Verse 10 said that while we were his enemies, he died for us. And in John 16, 34, uh, uh, 13, 34 and 35, he said, love one another the way I have loved you. By the way that you love one another, the world will know you are my disciples. The reason the world will know that you are his disciples is because your love is not based on their performance. Your, your value as a, as a man of God is not your title and position. It's not your skill set of who you are. It's not who you know. Now, I'm a, I'm a four square uh, pastor, and I have, a, I have a picture in my office at home. I don't have it at work, I keep it at home. And uh, it's, it's a picture of me and uh, who, uh, the fellow now who is the ex president of Foursquare. His name is Jack Hayford, and, and Jack has really been a big, huge influence in my Christian walk. And I have a picture of Jack and I, and it looks like we are buddies. 
Truth is, if we were walking down the street and ran into each other, he would, he would be thinking, you look familiar. I know you from somewhere. And what the picture doesn't show is that I was at a conference at his church. Uh, 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 it was it's called Jack Hayford School of Pastoral Nurturing. And what it doesn't show is that there were 49 men lined up right behind me to all have their picture with Pastor Jack. And that was one of the gifts I got because my value doesn't ch isn't changed because of who I know in terms of people. So my value is not by association. It's not by title and position. It's not by how wealthy I am or the possessions I have. It's not because of my appearance, which is really good. Uh, and it's not because of, of the skill set I have. My value is not based on anything that I do. My value is based on my being a son of a living God. Period. Isn't that true for you? And yet how many times in our relationships do we try to hide the bad and the ugly? How many times have you found yourself not wanting to be vulnerable with, 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 with everybody. So, so, so guys, can I tell you my most embarrassing story? It's really good. I mean, it's really sadly very good. I was doing my very first wedding as a, as a young pastor. And somebody wanted to get married, are you ready for this? On the Oregon coast, an outside wedding on June 19th. You know, that's asking for a rainstorm. But, but it turned out to be a beautiful day. There's about 600 people present. This couple is a loving couple. They're still, amazingly enough, they are still my friends. But uh, during the dress rehearsal, I was in trouble. Because no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't say their names correctly, just their first names. And again, these are friends of mine. And their names were Joe and Sue. And no matter how hard I tried, it came out so in Jew. Oh and I was so afraid that when I did my wedding for them, that I was going to blow the wedding. So, and, and this is the abbreviated short story. So I show up to do the wedding, and during the course of the ceremony, I'm concentrating, and all I'm working on is saying, Joe and Sue, just Joe and Sue, and, and, and everyone's paying attention uh, except the, the bride and the groom and the best man are all smirking, and the videos show, uh, matter of fact, it was the old VHF videos, there was three of them located, two guys trying to hold them up doing it, and they're showing this. And they show that there's a praying mantis walking back and forth across my Bible, up and down my arms, and I'm so concentrating, I don't see this praying man, this eight-inch praying mantis. And, and, and uh, the, the, the maid of honor wasn't laughing. She wasn't even having her eyes open. It turned out she was sick, and she was just trying to concentrate so she didn't faint. So she, she missed the whole thing. And I pronounce them husband and wife, and Joe and Sue kiss, and they, they start walking down this beautiful... Uh, rhododendron path with the rhododendrons in bloom. Everything is going great. And then I come back to the microphone to make my announcement. Joe and Sue are going to the other end of the park into the woods, and I'm supposed to say to consecrate their marriage in prayer. But that's not what I say. I say Joe and Sue are going to the other end of the park to consummate their marriage, and this is where it gets really bad and had their pictures taken. <laughs> and, and, and my wife is in the back and she hears this and she makes a beeline right through people, knocking chairs away and the, the, the video is still running and she comes up to me and I'm by the microphone and she, sa and she says, do you know what you just said? And I said, yes I did. And she says, no you don't. And when we looked at the video, you could see a clear line between the 25-year-olds and the old, those older than 25. The, those older than 25, you, they know what I said. The 25 and under were thinking, I thought I knew what that word meant, and they were perplexed. And boy, I was embarrassed. Talking about shame, this was a shameful moment for me. And so three weeks later, I'm at a pastor's conference in Bend, 
And, and, and you know, at every pastor's conference, there's a guy who's a glad hander. He's got shaking everyone's hand. He's the politician. And he comes to me and he reads my name. I was pastoring in Astoria. And he, and he sees my name and he says, Astoria, Astoria, are you the one? And I said, the one what? And he says, the one who did the wedding. And I have no idea how that got out, but it got out. And, and, and it turned, you know, I, I thought, oh, it's going to, I can't control this. Three years later, I'm at another pastor's conference, and my ex-pastor, who is now in charge of missions for the denomination, is saying, you guys are famous. And he starts going through all the bloopers that, that, that they've gone through. Uh, uh, one guy uh, was doing a love offering, but he called it a lust offering. Uh, an, another fellow was doing a, a, a teaching on John the Baptist, and he was in, really into his message, and 17 times referred to John the Baptist, only he, was referring, he referred to John the Baptist as John the Bastard. <laughs> you know, so it was really, really embarrassing. And then they get to the, to the, 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 the my pastor's name was Roy, and Roy starts talking about this guy who was at this, did this wedding, and he gave a location that was nothing like what, where it really was. And halfway through it, I thought, well, this is my story, but it's not the right location. And I, and I turned to my wife and I said, do you don't suppose anybody else could have done this? And she said, no. And anyway, he finishes the story, everyone laughs, and, and it's over with, until the next session, and the, the new district supervisor says, hey, everyone's coming to me thinking I did the wedding. It wasn't me who did the wedding. It was Harry who did the wedding. So this has followed me around now for uh, since 1982. Yeah, so I just celebrated 32, year, uh, 32 years of this embarrassing moment. But you know what? It has caused such life as I've learned to be able to tell that embarrassing story about uh, what I did. Uh, but to show up, be seen means no masks, and to live bravely is to, is to be obedient to what Jesus is asking you to do no matter what the consequences. That's what it means to live a life of faith, to show up where God's called you to show up, to be seen with no masks, and to be obedient to what Jesus is asking you to do. That's true when you're having a, a, a difficult conversation with your wife or your children or what you do when you are in relationship with, with a difficult member of your, of your church or your small group, whatever's going on. Uh, next slide, please. Here's the problem. You have desired values in your life. How many of you would raise your hand and say that you want to be known as an honest, truthful man? Okay, then how many of you have ever lied by omission? Okay, this is huge because what happens is we have two kinds of values that, that are important to us. Our aspired values, the, the, you know, the, the fruit of the spirit that we want to live by. But we also have what I call practice values. I got that word from Brene Brown, a great researcher. And she is uh, a, a woman of faith. She's Episcopalian. But she, she used the word practice values. You value avoiding confrontation. So you make choices, but now that becomes a roadblock to you living out being an honest, trustworthy, truthful person. And so you, we all have aspired values, and every one of us in this room has practiced values. How many of you, maybe like me, like to lose weight? And how many of you like cinnamon rolls? Yeah, so, we, so, so my practiced value is eating those roles, my desired value is to lose weight. So my practice value comes into conflict with my desired value. Go ahead, next slide. The journey of transformation needs to happen at multiple levels. 
We have to make the church of Jesus Christ a safe place for Christians to be honest and open about what they're struggling with. Uh, uh, I was a consultant for, there's a young man in, in, a, in a state not here in the Northwest who I love dearly. Young man, he's talented. The, the, uh, the denomination he worked with uh, hired me to do some work for them, and I was helping them process some things. He called me up and he said, hey, we had an elder in our church have an affair with his next-door neighbor.